Hey everybody, this is Brian from Breaking Down Security. What you're going to hear this week is part two of our interview with Jack from the Darknet Diaries. Uh, we're going to talk about some events that have happened uh, the people in the InfoSec industry may not know about if they're new to, uh, new to InfoSec. Uh, or, you know, if you lived through it, like say the Config or Worm, you might, uh, you know, look back and, and smile and, you know, shake your head about how ignorant we were. But the what Jack does is since the, the events are in the past, he can go back through, you know, various, you know, news articles or what have you and find re- and research these uh, events and give you a, a more uh, full picture of, you know, what happened, how it happened, and maybe who even hap- uh, did it. So um, he might uh, do one on the SQL Slammer Worm, or he might do one on uh, a hacking of, uh, you know, a, a specific breach or something that happened in the past. So if you're interested in his show... Uh, You can find out about that at the end of our podcast this week. So I'm going to let the show happen. So, uh, yeah, take it away, everybody. Okay. So number three, I, I, this one, this one got me all nostalgic. I, you know, shed a tear a little bit for, you know, old timey days here. Um, So Jack, you're saying back in the nineties, strong crypto was illegal online. Now, um, what, what exactly do you mean by that? There, to be honest, back in the nineties, crypto wasn't all that strong to begin with, was it? Right. No, it was just Des. So uh, I was, uh, you know, as I'm making, I'm making show, I'm trying to come up with some, some interesting topics and something that's just always been interesting to me for years is the crypto wars of the nineties. And it first came on my radar, even though I, I was, I was in the nineties doing computer. I was, I was on muds back then, uh, oh. playing muds back way back then. Very but, nice. um, there was, um, there was listening to Cory Doctorow's book, um, little brother. Mm-hmm. And very briefly, he talked about how there was this crypto wars and it was the people versus the government, all about cryptography, cryptography and encryption. And I was like, I got to know more about this. So I dove into this and, and as it turns out pretty much all through the nineties, um, starting, starting with the cold war, um, encryption was on the munitions list for the government. So right. it's the same thing as like a Stinger missile or any military grade weapon. You couldn't transport it over over uh, borders without some sort of permit. And encryption right. was on that same list. So anytime encryption is going to pass over the U.S. border, you needed a permit. And of course, the Internet is just all over the world. So there's there's no way. So the only thing that they would allow to go over the border was DES. Um Yep. And already by the '90s, we knew Des was not very strong, yep. so it just it just wasn't a solution. So it took I think it was Phil, Phil Zimmerman that got it started. He started to, to sue the government um, over his PGP tool. He wanted to be able to ship that across the borders, and then there was a few teachers and lawyers and professors, as well as the EFF, all got involved with. I think there were three or four lawsuits. Um, Actually, Phil Zimmerman didn't get didn't sue him. Uh, the The government came after Phil because they were really concerned about PGP, mm. and and so there was just a, a ton of pressure. Uh, there was three lawsuits against the government to say we need this, we need this to be stronger. And there was AES at the time that was already a thing, and it was uh, Schneier, Bruce Schneier. I even wrote wrote a book on cryptography at the time, outlining all these better solutions Mm -hmm. and here's the crazy thing so that book you could ship it across borders even though it has formulas for cryptography in the book that's that could be shipped but one of the professors said i'm going to put this on a cd and ship it across the borders and the government said no you can't put it on a cd and ship it because now it's an electronic form and now it's a munitions list and your ship you can't do this so it it became a first amendment right we can't even talk about this stuff anymore you can't, we can't, you know, like, why is a book okay, but a CD's not? And it just became so ridiculous. Um, so uh, eventually the, um, the, uh, the, the people won on this one. Obviously, we know mm-hmm. how strong encryption is loud now. Yep. But one of the things that kind of broke the, uh, broke, broke it down was um, the EFF built a tool to demonstrate that DES was weak. And they were able to crack Des with the off off the shelf computers in a, in under a day. It was like 24, 22 hours. They could crack a, a Des message with just off the shelf stuff. 
Wow. And it's like, come on, like you really want this to be our strongest, like this is what banks are using, hospitals, everything. And this is this is all that's allowed. And finally the government said, you're right, it's no longer strong enough. And yeah. and it was uh it was just taken off the munitions list entirely and they let the internet to be used whatever encryption you want. Yeah. And it was just a big battle in the nineties. Yeah, so so for you young punks out there, uh Dez is um uh, uh, data encryption standard. They uh, upgraded it to something called triple DES, which had three keys, but DES was only a 56 bit key. So there was only two to the 56 possible ways in which a message could be encrypted. So that's, you know, uh, if you, if you go on our show notes, the, the Wikipedia article is, uh, is available to, uh, to look at, but, um, <clears throat> yeah. Um, I, you know, this reminds me cause when I was in the Navy, uh, one of the things I did on an Island, in the middle of the Indian Ocean was, um, you know, maintaining the IT computers. And Microsoft at the time, you know, I was using Windows 2000, the latest hotness, and IE6 was the, the brand new browser that was available, but um, I couldn't download the 128-bit version because I was overseas. Um, I actually had to have a friend of mine from San Diego download the, the EXE and then, you know, send it to me so that I could get it. And it was, you know, he had to send it to me by, you know, zip archive. So I had like 150 zip files that he emailed me so that I could deploy it over my network. Um, but yeah, I could not access it cause I was outside of the United States. Um, and that was, Oh hell, that was 1999, I think. So 1999, 2000 was when I was there. So, um, yeah, I mean, that stuff was, was still, uh, an issue even then. So, um, for any of you who remember that, that's, uh, you know, that was available. Yeah. So yeah, that, that's about the same time. So the EFF built deep crack, which broke the DES standard using, uh, um, uh, for $250,000, which at the time now, $250,000 in this day and age would crack pretty much anything. I think, uh, if you bought enough Amazon, <laughs> uh, GPUs, so um, took 56 hours of work and, uh, they won $10,000. So they spent 250,000. They won 10,000. Yeah. But it, it, so that was their first version. Uh, 56 hours is, is what they first came at. And the government right. still said, eh, we don't think that's, you know, fast enough. Right. Um, and they kept it on like the, um, NIST kept it on the, the they, they said, no, it's still secure. Even after it's been cracked at 54 hours. And so they had to come up with another version to crack it even faster before yeah. they finally gave in. Yep. Uh, yeah, it is. It was expensive, but they still they just use off the shelf stuff. So any anybody who's you know motivated enough or funded enough could could be cracking this stuff. Yeah, no, that's cool. And another big part of this was when um, the Clipper chip came out at the same time. So this was a, a an encryption chip that would go into electronics and and, and encrypt something. I don't even know what what it would encrypt it as, but it would encrypt it very strongly. And the other end would decrypt it with the clipper chip. Mm -hmm. But Matt Blaze, which is a prominent security researcher, showed us that you can find, like, so the so clipper chip had a backdoor that the government was the only one that should have had access to it. Right. But Matt Blaze just showed us how you can easily get through the backdoor. It was vulnerable to attacks. And anyone could really uh, use the clipper chip to their, to their advantage. Yeah, and that so that was, a big, that was a big deal, too. That, that's interesting. So the, the, the government put a backdoor inside these chips. Uh, we're very much still talking about trying to put encryption backdoors into systems and people seem to have forgotten the clipper chip was a thing at the time. So, um, you know, it, it's interesting how we you know, have, have forgotten that, you know, the government lost control of the backdoor that they'd put into place and somebody found it and could learn how to use it and, um, you know, exploit that possibly. So. Um, yeah, that was, I, I do remember the clipper chip now that I look at it. Um, yeah, it's, it's still a heated debate. And I think that's why I like having these conversations. That's why I like to bring this stuff up is, is to hear what, what people are saying, because when you, when you have a government that wants to protect its people and that's, you know, that, you know that's what it's supposed to do. That's its mission. And, and it can't because there's just so much encryption, then it, it really feels frustrated and it tries to be clever with, with figuring this out. Mm -hmm. Um, and of course, you know, you get people who are like, well, you're going too far government if you want to be able to decrypt everything and all this stuff. And, and it's, it's a, it's an interesting debate. Yeah. Yeah. 
<clears throat> so along the same lines of uh, you know playing in the government, uh, so you've got here number four, the NSA scrapes social media and regular OSINT and use regular OSINT techniques to figure out how to best attack a network. I'm not sure how that's such a big deal. I mean, I know Miss Berlin, you know, set it up a bunch of fake like LinkedIn accounts last year for our, our CTF with the idea that people would do OSINT to figure out how to attack our CTF. I mean, how, how is, how is the fact that the government is doing the same thing, uh, any, any different than what a normal person doing a CTF or, you know, doing a regular, you know, pen testing engagement would do? Yeah, it's not really that different. Um, but what I got was, was an APT on my, on my episode, basically. Right. I don't know if he's from NSA or FBI, he wouldn't tell me, but, um, you know, he was deep in, he was deep in there and, um, and to hear how he how he scours Reddit for certain usernames or or, or stuff like what you know he was trying to attack a foreign embassy mm-hmm. and he would he would find the people on LinkedIn who work at that embassy that are in the IT department and they would say things like oh I'm really good at Oracle 12 and then he's like okay well I think this company pro- you know this embassy probably is running Oracle 12 right. and then he you can he can link that to uh, Reddit names and start looking through just our sysadmin and it's just amazing because this is a Reddit subreddit I'm on. And right. to think that there's also the NSA is looking at this right now is it, just, it kind of just brings it home mm-hmm. and, and it scares the crap out of me. Like, yeah, I think us as security people know not to put this stuff up there, but the, the coders, the programmers, the database admins, they're like, Hey, can somebody help me troubleshoot this vulnerability? And they'll put it up on stack, uh, you know, stack overflow yeah. or whatever yeah. with, with IP stuff in there. Like it's right. so it's ridiculous. So, okay. In that case, so a lot of companies are like, you know, you need to scrub your uh, social media accounts. You need to, you know, don't tell people where you work at. Um, do they need to take it further when they're talking about social media to say, okay, you need to, you know, think about what you're you're sharing or do does your internal red team need to be, I don't know, taking a look at, you know, where people are surfing the web and, you know, following and shadowing those people on, on social media to, to find out what they're doing. Cause like you said, with stack overflow, they're popping source code in that is obviously being used at their own organization. So that lets bad guys in on whatever code is inside the environment, which if they've posted something that has a known vulnerability in it, or they can show that it, what well, right here, this line has a known vulnerability in it, that could be used to exploit that environment. Yeah, obviously their their security awareness training did not work at that foreign government agency because <laughs> they're still putting you know identifiable stuff right there on the internet, easy to see. And and for me, I don't have a LinkedIn account because I don't want to be part of this problem. And it's it's weird that my company asked me for my LinkedIn account sometimes, my old company that I would work with. Right. Like, can you can you give us your LinkedIn account? I'm like, no, because I don't want the world to know that this is you know, not only who works there, but also like what I'm good at. I'm good at ArcSight. I'm good at Cisco right. ASAs. Like now you know what we're running internally. And, right. and it's like, you can, you can have one of my LinkedIn accounts if you want. <laughs> uh, yeah. Um, yeah. I don't, uh, I try not to advertise who I work for. Well, I mean, that was in the past, the things with the new job, it's kind of in flux right now. I don't know if I'm going to drop my OPSEC a little bit. It's, it's a different throughout model for me. So, I mean, you know, what, I was doing in my other job and what we did in my other job was quite a bit more, I would say sensitive than what I'm doing now. My current job is a PM. So, um, you know, I won't, I won't tell people I can't tell you where I work, but you know, if you ask me directly, then I'll, you know, I'll, I'll tell you, but I mean, for me, OPSEC was a big thing for, for the longest time. And, um, it, it feels weird to, you know, think about, you know, dropping the, you know, dropping that kind of, you know, hard-lined OPSEC rule for for a lot of people. So um, <clears throat> anyway, so I'm sorry, I digressed. Uh, so, I mean, what? okay, so you had somebody on who was doing this kind of stuff. What kind of regular OSINT techniques were they using? Were they using any specific sites? Were they, uh, you know, using any kind of, you know, special, you know, uh, you know software to, to do OSINT? Yeah, so it's really interesting uh, episode. I think uh, that's going to be episode ten if you want to check it out of Darknet mm-hmm. Diaries. Um, he he breaks it down step by step. Um, the it, 
it's really fascinating that they do a lot of OSINT, a ton of OSINT before they are able to do anything because at, in, in, in the government, you have to get permission to use these vulnerabilities. Right. And then you have to show like how much risk it is to use these vulnerabilities. And so they need, like, they're going to build a whole attack package saying, well, we need something that's going to attack Oracle 12. And, and they need right. to go and actually, you know, you, you've seen the, the playbook that, that, that the NSA has and stuff. So they, they're, they have to, they can't, they just don't have access to everything and, 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 and approval for everything. They have to be very specific of what they're going to use. So this whole OSINT process is massive and it takes a team of like 10, 15 people, three months. And if you can imagine a, a full time, three months of, of 15 people trying to get a full dossier from, uh, you know, off of a foreign government agency, they're going to have it completely detailed. And yeah, it goes through LinkedIn. It then connects that you know, person to, to MySpace, Facebook, Reddit, everywhere they can to get more information. Like every single thing that person has ever posted online, they're going to, they're going to download that and save that and have screenshots of that and try to build it out. And they got it down to the, down to the version of, of windows that that sysadmin is running. And so they got a list of every single sysadmins that's on the network, every list of every DBA, the entire source code for their website and their servers that they're running like everything. If you if you connect the yarn enough on the internet, these the the, the NSA has has and this all through OSINT. So there's like no special tools that they had, right. and there was no there were no alarms that they could have possibly tripped to yeah. uh, grab this stuff because it's all on public space. It's just time and effort. Yeah, yeah, and they have it. They have the the you know the resources to do that. Makes sense. Makes sense. Um, <clears throat> Uh, Mr. Betcher, Ms. Berlin, you have any thoughts or any anything you'd like to add to that? OSINT's powerful, man. I I totally take a, a job doing purely OSINT. I think that'd yeah. be a lot of fun. <laughs> yeah, you yeah. probably could. Now there there's probably a a model for this, but put out fake stuff like a fake vulnerability, sort of like almost a a, a token where you would have a an alarm bell go off if somebody tried to exploit something that you put on say stack overflow or whatever or reddit and ask mm -hmm. the question hey here's my code and um somebody tries to exploit it yep right. yeah so so i think you we can think about that sort of having uh fake uh data on your company if you really care about that right yeah, I um I posted a link in our OSINT channel because we have an OSINT and a social engineering channel about um uh, one of our one of our members named Gary posted FCC.io, which if you're doing any kind of hardware hacking uh, or need an FCC ID for for some kind of electronic uh, you know gadget or you know com, com, you know uh, bit inside your system, you can look up. Uh, you know, useful information in there, test setup data, manuals, internal photos of the components, etc. I mean, you know, if you need that kind of information or that granularity, I mean, that stuff is out there. So, I mean, that could just add additional uh, uh, information to how you're, you know, to, to what you need to exploit your, your, your potential uh, target, especially if they're using specialized hardware. So, um, all right, so one more. I think we can do one more here. We're at fifty-two minutes, somewhat, right now. So you've got a you, you did a show with a, a gentleman by the name of Manfred. You say he did mm -hmm. a living hacking uh, MMOs, which is massive multiplaying uh, RPGs like World of Warcraft, Dark Age of Camelot. That one, that one's dating myself. I apologize. Uh, and for the last twenty years, and he tried to do it as ethically as possible. So. He's ethically hacking MMOs. Yeah, it's really it's it's a it, and that's the thing that kind of gets me about this is uh, is there a, is it possible to be an ethical black hat hacker? Uh, what this guy did was um, he would find flaws in in MMOs that would allow him to maybe duplicate the stuff on his character. So now you know if he's got a thousand gold, now he's got two thousand gold. Uh -huh. um, he's not impacting any other players. He's not. Uh, you know, competing with the business model of the of the game makers because back in Dark Age of Camelot, they weren't selling gold; they were only selling a monthly subscription. Right. So there was no in-app purchases for almost the last twenty years. It's only recently started showing up. Yeah. So he he had no he wasn't you know 
in his mind, I'm, I'm talking about, you know, what his point of view is here. Right. Um, he did not feel like he was doing anything, you know, against the game. I, I don't know. It, it, he didn't think it was being unethical because there were, there were some, some Chinese and Russian hackers that would actually try to, to get into other players' accounts mm -hmm. and, and steal their, steal all their gear, strip them. And then, you know, and they, they would do that by creating like fan pages for those games and then as you log into those fan pages, now you've, you've just given your password to a Chinese hacker or something right. like that. Right. So they were actually just stripping things like crazy. Now I think that's unethical sure. uh, because you're damaging the other players and you're causing a problem. Yeah. Um, in this case, he never wanted to do that. I mean, he did, he did in his early days when he just started learning about what he could do here. But, um, you know, as he got better, he said, I, I don't think I want to hurt any other players. Mm-hmm. Yeah, back in the day, um, like Dark Age of Camelot, there was one I used to play uh, when I was on that island in the Indian Ocean uh, called Asheron's Call. I used to play it over dial-up with a 750 millisecond ping rate, and it would still work fine, which is ironic because you never can do that at this day and age. Um, but yeah, it, was, it wasn't a freemium model like we, we normally have these days with a lot of MMOs where you can play for free and then you just you know pay for for everything inside that can definitely dis destabilize a, a you know a, a you know a, an mmo by by doing so um so what did did he finally get bored well, i mean why did he quit doing it did, i think he still he quit because it? because of the in-app purchases now he's competing directly with the game makers he could still mm -hmm. get all the gold he wants out of these things but when they're also selling gold now it might be illegal. Now they've got reasons to come after him. But right. he, all these years, they, nobody ever came after him. There were no lawyers coming after him. There was a couple cease and desists. And right. I mean, we're talking about 20 different games. Ultima Online, Astron's Call, Final Fantasy, Dark Age of Camelot, World of Warcraft, uh, uh, like tons and tons of games. So when he just did this over and over, and what he was using was like reverse engineering the game client. Mm -hmm. So he'd find bugs in, in, on his computer. So he was never actually hacking into their service. He was always doing it locally on his own computer and often doing a, kind of a man in the middle as well, where the packet would go from his computer to the server and he would change a value on the way there. Mm, right. Um, right. And it would just say, well, this person now has a billion gold or something. And that was it. Mm. Well, I mean, if it was that easy, I mean, if anybody could just fire up burp and, you know, change how much gold you've got, then I mean, there, for, there's for, definitely for Dark Age of Camelot, well, actually, it was a shadow bane. It was there was no server side validation, so you could absolutely do it with Burp, uh, it for for that game. And was, he was able to do everything. He was able to set himself max level, uh, wow. bring dragons into the newbie area, uh, set whatever equipment he wanted, just because it was just you know set ID character, and boom, you're, you've got it. There's no server side validation. I was doing that wrong the whole time. I was actually trying to play the game and grind for hours on end. <laughs> man damn anyway so he, does he still do it or did he just you know grow out of playing mmos no he, ha he hung up and that's why he's able to talk about this now uh last year at defcon he gave a talk um he was he was going to demonstrate some of this stuff for like wildstar online right um, which is current game that's going on mm -hmm. um, he has a way to get 18 quintillion gold by uh, manipulating one of the auctions Wow. Um, but the goons told him, don't, don't demonstrate like <laughs> zero days right on stage. You don't right. want that kind of stuff. Right. So he didn't. And then his talk did get put on the, on YouTube because that's where all DEF CON talks eventually end up. Mm -hmm. But it got as, it got a cease and desist from one of the, uh, the game makers right. said, Oh, please don't talk about the vulnerabilities in our game. And so DEF CON had to take down the YouTube video. So Great. it kind of went away for a while. And that's why I said, I need to get this guy. I need to get this story out there. So yeah. Yeah, it's back, cool. it's back out there because of uh, dark Knight diaries. Awesome. <clears throat> All right. Well, um, I think, I think that's it. I, uh, I do appreciate you coming on the show. Uh, you know, I, I do find that the, we don't do a lot of history. I know, uh, Mr. Mr. Daniels, uh, does like infosec history. So he talks about, you know, somebody in InfoSec that has, or, you know, in history that has done something for computer science or for, for InfoSec. Um, he, he does that at, at cons. Um, your, your podcast uh, is very interesting with, you know, talking about the, the history of that. So I, I assume it's, it's purely unvarnished and you try to give all possible sides to the, to the, to the discussion when you're doing them. 
Yeah, I tried to take a journalistic approach and really not interject my uh, opinions in anything. And just, you know, if it's published somewhere else, I'm going to probably talk about it and not really bring in my own thing. But with my background in security, I'm able to uh, try to break it down as simple as possible, because one of the things I want to do is share these stories with with non-infosec people as well, where it doesn't really matter your your knowledge of, of security. You can still understand what a default password is and how dam- how dangerous that is to you. Right, right. Um, okay. So, um, how often do these come out right now? I'm publishing monthly monthly. Okay. Very cool. And we're at 16 episodes. Nice. So yeah. it's binge worthy. Okay. So, um, Jack, if people wanted to maybe give you ideas for future podcasts, or, uh, maybe there's somebody who has done something interesting cause you do do interviews. You had the, the gentleman Manfred on, um, uh, how would they go about getting a hold of you if they wanted to talk, contact you? Yeah, sure. Um, I'm I'm definitely looking for really interesting, intriguing infosec stories, and we've all been to these infosec uh, conferences and heard some crazy stuff over a couple beers or whatever it is. Right. Um, and those are the things that are the you know the juiciest ones that like we we'd rather not say are probably the best, but they're really hard to get a hold of. So right. um, if you have something that's just an amazing infosec story, I'd love to hear it. Um, I'm on Twitter a lot. Uh, my Twitter handle is at Tunnels Up. But you can find me uh, lots of different contact ways to find me at darknetdiaries.com. Cool. Very nice. All right. Uh, Miss Berlin, uh, I know that you are always available for doing the keynotes and, and such. Uh, where are you going to be in the next few weeks? You know, I feel like I'm like once you do one, you're you're on this automatic like thought leader keynote list that people always want to like. Do, should we put that in your business you card? Biz- I'm, I'm thinking about it. Yeah. Amanda Berlin. Someone leader. got a hold of my business cards, you know, the one with my uh, my creepy face. Right, right. And they ended up in all the book giveaways at Converge. Oh wow! I think it was Tim to block, but I'm I'm not sure. Wow. Well, you know, Tim, thank you for doing that. <laughs> you you made the world a like, lot. Like at first, I thought he just put it in mine, but then like people were flipping to the other ones. They're like, "Why is this business card in here?" And like, "Oh, why is that my <laughs> business card in there?" <laughs> <laughs> very nice very nice so how would how would people get a hold of you if they wanted to uh you know discuss your book or discuss doing a keynote you will travel for them you've gone to all the way down to new zealand so i can't imagine you wouldn't go anywhere else and zurich in june i'm still super excited oh, snap. about it. i forgot about that hope yeah. i can walk by then oh that's right you got a gimpy knee right um how, how would they get a hold of you uh, at, on Twitter at info sister, I N F O S Y S T I R. Okay. Uh, do you know if the, if that meeting in Zurich, if there are still tickets available for that, what is, what is that? Or what is that? It is area 41 con. Area it is their DEF CON con group, uh, putting together a conference. Okay. Um, I wonder if there's any tickets available for that still. Let me see. Maybe. Uh, well, their Twitter, they area 41 con hasn't tweeted yet. All right. Well, that's, that's very, very good. Okay. Um, anyway, so, uh, keep looking and let me know, uh, Mr. Betcher, if people wanted to discuss, you know, log MD or how it works, or, um, if they wanted to talk to you about malware in general, how would they go about doing so? They can hit me up on the DM on Twitter at Betcher Pwned, B-O-E-T-T-C-H-E-R-P-W-N-E-D. Ah, oh, he's all, all hip with the kids on hip, hip, hit me up on the DMs and stuff. Got it. Yeah. They yeah. are. They do still have tickets available, and I don't know what this translates to in USD, but it is two hundred and seventy-five dollars. Okay, which um, I think is cl- pretty close to one to one with their currency. Okay, what's the website? It is area forty-one dot io. Area forty-one dot io. Very interesting. Area forty-one. I can't type tonight. Area 41.io. All right. So there's a link in the show notes to area 41.io where Ms. Berlin will be keynoting again in Zurich. I'm not keynoting on that one. I'm just talking. Oh, you're just talking in, but it's in Zurich, Switzerland. And you know, that's, that's an awesome place. Pretty much good enough reason to go to anything. I've been to, I've been to Geneva, which is a fantastic city. Uh, I can only imagine Zurich is, is, is awesome. So uh, yeah, get, get over there and get you some chocolate and, and, you know, get to meet some people. So awesome. Uh, So uh, we have a Slack channel. If you are interested in joining our Slack channel, which has, I don't know, according to our hallway con, which is our general chat, we have 1,201 users on there. Uh -uh. 
Yeah, I know. Oh yeah, we've broke twelve hundred, and and I think we have about three to four hundred active users, probably four closer to four fifty. But if you're interested in doing that, um, you can DM us at the show's Twitter by going to at breaksec b r a k e s c c, or you can email us at bds.podcast at gmail dot com. Uh, you can follow me on Twitter uh, at Brian Break b r y a n b r a k e. We also are on uh, Google Play Store. If you want to listen to that, or if you want to tell a friend about us, uh, and they go, "Well, I, you know, I don't know if I like what, listening to podcasts," and they're probably not on anything we are on. We're on the Google Play Store. We're on Apple Podcasts. If you're an Apple Podcast, please, uh, you know, leave feedback. That makes sure that new listeners will have a better chance of finding us, and we appreciate you for doing so. Uh, we're also on the TuneIn Radio app. We're on Stitcher. Uh, we just put the BDIR podcast, which Mister Betcher does with Michael Goff. Um, on um, uh, Stitcher as well. We're in Spotify. Uh, BDIR isn't yet, but uh, the Breaking Down Security Podcast is on Spotify, so you can go search for us on that. All of the links to where we're at is in the show notes, so if you're confused or bewildered or lost, you can find us in the show notes. So, uh, Lastly, uh, I'd like to thank uh, a gentleman by the name of Tim. He uh, donated to our Patreon, gave us $10 a month. I'm not sure what? why. Maybe he made a rounding error or something, and it was. $1. Why'd you tell him? <laughs> I, I, I felt I almost was like, "Are you sure you want to give that much?" Because I'm like, "You don't really have to," but like that's as much as Netflix. I know. Like put that in perspective. Thank like, you. I, I don't know that we're. I'm pretty sure. I'm pretty sure we're not as worth worth as much as Netflix. Yeah, that's like half a cup Monthly. of coffee for me. Yeah, yeah. Once I get my my six shot, you know, latte in the morning, that's like twelve bucks or something. So. Thank you for you know giving me coffee for you know a couple of days or so. I appreciate well, you. I think Tim. we can help people's careers, whereas Netflix might hinder them. You know, <laughs> you, can either, you can either listen to some some security knowledge, that's, right? That's true. Or you can veg out on a season of whatever show. Well, yeah. your interest. That's true. I watch I watch the uh, I watch the uh, the documentary thing on uh, McAfee. Oh hell! Well, holy crap. Like I'm, there was some stuff I definitely learned, but I'm good on that. I don't need to see that. Um, you should watch it. No thanks. Good. No, I'm I'm really good. I'm I'm really okay with not watching that. I don't understand Infosex um, like deal with him. Somebody's like, oh, he's you know he's awesome. He's John McAfee. He's like you know somebody's grandpa. And I'm like, I sold him lockpicks once. This is super creepy. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. you you sold him lockpicks. Yeah, that's there's yeah. yeah At DuffCon, I work the uh, tool booth. Ah, all right. Yeah, I don't understand Infosex, uh, you know, obsession with like John McAfee. He's not an anti-hero in my opinion, but uh, I'll take your hate mail. BDS. It's kind of like a train wreck. You just like it's you... fun to watch. Oh, okay. I can see that. Yeah. You know, all right. I mean, no, I, I don't know. <laughs> yeah. No, that makes sense. All right. Well, um, anybody else have any other thoughts or anything? Um. Oh, uh, yeah, Jack, how would people get a hold of your podcast? Oh, that's at darknetdiaries.com, and it's available in all your uh, podcast players. Okay, darknetdiaries.com, right on. Okay, thank you, Jack, for coming on the show. Um, I I hope that, uh, you know, you have continued success, and, uh, you know, uh, he will be looking for a job in a couple of months, he says. Uh, he didn't say that on the show, I don't think. He just did <laughs> because I said it. But, uh, you know, if you're looking for uh, what, are, what are you looking for in a job if you're looking? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, CEO, are you trying to, <laughs> to what? it's hard to tell. I, I've been I have a lot of experience with blue team, but the red team is also very interesting to me. So um, we'll see. We'll see actually when I get there. OK, cool. All right. Well, um, that's it for this week's uh, episode of Breaking Down Security. Everyone have a great week. Please be nice to one another and we will talk to you again soon. All right. Bye. Bye.